All right, everybody. Twisted History Podcast starring me. That's it. Nobody else is here. So it's Twisted History Podcast. It's myself. It's my good friend, Jeff Vibbert. It's my other good friend, Jack Coleman. And it winds up Annie and I decided to give it one last go. We were divorced for a short time, and uh, we're back. So we're getting remarried in Vegas in two weeks. So St. Ann uh, is in the house. That was, a, that was a dark week. It was we a had, roller coaster. We had Machine Gun Kelly, one of the greatest musicians of all time, yes. and Megan Fox break up. And then we had you guys break up. Yeah. 25th anniversary of me getting down on one knee on the Champs-Élysées as the lights go on in the Eiffel Tower and asking her to be my wife. On the 25th anniversary of that day, I filmed the podcast without her and told everyone we were getting divorced. <laughs> so, so there Except it is. me. I had Except no idea. Except you. I forgot yeah. to tell you. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, we're going to start with Beavers today. Beavers, there's a huge, <laughs> sorry about that, sweetheart, yeah, uh, there's a huge controversy in the world of beaver history. I don't know if you guys know this. Do you, are you aware of this? Oh. For some reason, you're a beaver enthusiast. I, I do dabble in beaver history. <laughs> I, I, I know it in and out. But didn't you, when we, there was an operation, when we did a twisted history of military operations, I remember this vividly, but not vividly enough to know what you had thrown at me, and there was an operation beaver trap. Yep, there was an Operation Breakfast. Like we were, we were raiding the the um, the names, how they were. Like Rolling Thunder is great, you know. Uh, Wrath of God was awesome, but there was one that was Beaver Trap. And I thought you threw some sort of like Beaver enthusiasts fact at me at the time. Am I out of my fucking mind? He was also uh, big on raccoons. Uh, big oh, on raccoons. Oh, I'd raccoons. Be raccoons. Well, I I will say this: a beaver. A female beaver is much bigger than you would think. That's you were running and yeah. you saw a huge beaver. So we, we would run on like these bike trails down by the river uh -huh. and we saw this, this mama beaver just in all her wet, furry glory just sitting on the bank of the river. Right. And she had six of the biggest titties I've ever seen. Really? Just all hunched over wet and just Wow. Bleh. I got the big titties <laughs> out of the way. I'm, it's not right yeah. five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got a couple more tucked in. That's definitely what it was. But at frumpy. The word I would use to describe that beaver was frumpy. Really? Yeah. It was, it was bigger yeah. than you thought. Massive. I had seen a raccoon come barreling across a road, a country road, and um, I think we were living in Atlanta at the time, so we were outside of Atlanta, so it really was a country road. Cuts through everywhere, the whole deal. Raccoon was barrel ass, and it was just this big ass on it, and this little small body. It was very, uh, you know, bottom heavy. And a, and a pickup truck hit it, and a pickup truck swerved and almost got into an accident. I think it did some real fucking damage. And that's when I noticed that raccoons can be goddamn huge, too. They're massive. Yeah, yeah. All right, so big beavers. Let's start with the. So this is the controversy in beaver history, Okay. How did the vagina become known as a beaver? And that's where the controversy is. Like everyone, oh, nice beaver. Had it stuffed that's myself. That's the beginning to a great joke. I was like, is this a Bob Hope <laughs> bit? I looked at his face. No, like, he's, but, he's waiting for a punchline. Yeah. No, like, so if you, if you say, uh, how did it become known as a dick? Like, there is no defined reason that you call a penis a dick. I'll find one. But there's uh, there's a legend that there was an officer who liked to expose himself, and he like ran out into no man's land in World War One, you know, with his cock out, and that's how he wound up dying. And his name was like you know Dick Worthington or something. So that it was named after Dick. So there's no defined thing on how a dick became known as a dick. So I always been fascinated on how things got their names. Always been fascinated with the uh, with the with the origin of that, and. Beaver is one of those things because I think generationally people recognize those stupid puns. Do you know what I mean? Like when you mm -hmm. said, oh, a big wet beaver, I'd be like, oh, you know, I've been enough of those. You know what I mean? Like that type you, of thing. You got to make a joke. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the three schools of thought and here's where the controversy lies. And then you make your own decision because what history does is allow you to have an opinion and make decisions. <laughs> right. Let's start with the hairless theory. Okay. Some say a vagina is called a beaver because when it's bare, it looks like the gap between a beaver's two big front teeth. Whoa. Whoa. Now, a picture in your head. I know it's been a while, Jack. A hairless nice. vagina. Purposely hairless. Not underage. Nice. Fresh out of a Brazilian. And then picture a beaver's teeth in the gap. So picture Michael Strahan, almost. <laughs> so that's the hairless theory. 
I don't know if I like. I like Michael Strahan. That's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah, I don't right. like that theory. I'm waiting for the next two. Back around the 17th century, people came to believe that sexually transmitted diseases in crabs were passed through contact with pubic hair, so prostitutes were forced to shave off their pubes. We've talked about this before, to be quite honest with you. That's when bordellos started to also become known as baldy houses. But unlike today, where people are like some women in porn think that a single pubic hair is an absolute, you know, <laughs> offense to their genitals. But back then, a shaved pubis pubis was weird and they didn't like it. So that's when they started the idea of Merkins, like which people now use, particularly like cancer patients and mm -hmm. stuff like that, who just or people who just want to spice up their love life by having a different wig that they would wear in and around their vaginas. It's also a pigmentation thing, by the way. Sure. Absolutely. Because if you the less air that gets to Why it. Are you doing this? Yeah. <laughs> you too. The visualization helps me. Right, right. <laughs> no, but so the it's air true. that gets to it. The yeah, air that if if the more covered your privates are, the uh -huh. darker they get. Like that's why you'll see like Discolored? a lot of Discolored? Yes, that's why a lot of people have to get if they have hair, they will get bleached because yes. they're not as Absolutely. light or pink as mm -hmm. you would. As the some may prefer. <laughs> some may not prefer the stray hand. They right. may want a some like a little one. landing strip. The hooker's customers found the bear look unnatural and unattractive, right? Mm -hmm. The solution to have little wigs known as merkins made of their material of choice for these hair pieces. And that material of choice was oftentimes beaver pelt. It was selected because of the natural feel of the beaver's hair. So there you go. Since that day, vaginas have often been referred to as beavers. So that's the hairy theory. That makes sense. The teeth for bald, the hair on a beaver represent it, uh, you know, resembling pubic hair. That's the hairy theory. I enjoy the hairy theory. You do. I enjoy the idea of putting little wigs on your private <laughs> yeah. parts as well. It's, it's very cute. You can get creative yeah. with it. You can shave a mullet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. we'll really stash. express who you are. That's yeah. right. That's right. And entomology online. <laughs> entomology online. I, I prescribe to it. Subscribe to it. Affirms the hairy theory and says that the beaver in the gynecological sense is actually from the British slang dating from 1927, and the appearance of split, furry beaver pelts. Again, like you think of uh, douche companies, Summer's Eve, you know what I mean? Like originally that was named Musty Pelts, but it wasn't pushing their products, so they moved to Summer's Eve. And they even cite a limerick. There was a young lady named Eva who filled up a bath to receive her. She took off her clothes from her head to her toes when a voice at the keyhole yelled, Beaver. <laughs> that's kind of a cute limerick. Yeah, I, I kind of like that. Please don't teach that to any of our. Apparently, kids. it's a theme. There's there's a bunch of evil limericks. Yeah, they all have um, just kind of like sexual innuendos throughout. They're all of awesome. them. I just got a book for my birthday, a little limerick book. Really? They're, they're amazing. Yeah. Even, there was even Receiva is such a like that's like a Kendrick Lamar rhyme. To rhyme. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. Had to receive this one is bad. <laughs> there was a young lady Solid. named Eva who went to the ball. As Godiva instead of Godiva, you're the a naked one. But a change in the lights showed a tear in her tights, and a low fellow present yelled, Beaver, meaning like a za, right? Because he was lower or something like that, perhaps. Others say, and so that's the hairy theory. That's the hairy theory. So the hairless theory, the hairy theory. The final one says that it refers to the smell, because a beaver that is caged or trapped puts off a strong musky odor. So that's the scented theory with like it's with its anal glands, right? I, yeah, well, we're going to definitely get into that, but I think in general, From all the fish. beavers or uh, like they well, that just, would be a dirty beaver. That's a yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's the like scent. The one Vib saw with the yeah, you know, hanging out. Oh, she I'm was team dirty. I'm team hairless. Scratching herself. I like the idea of the teeth, for some reason. Yeah, I'm team hairless. <laughs> Is anyone team hairless? Yeah, team hairy. I I th I. I'm not a fan of hair. I'm the. So. Wait, are we talking to? No, for the theory. No, the not theory. for your yeah, own general. Yeah. Hey, Annie, please. No, for the theory. Jesus of Christ, you have three personal. kids. <laughs> well, it okay. sounded like we were I'm going personal. About the I was about yeah. to give away my personal preferences. And just Who's like, going to yeah. go directly to that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and finally, some think it's because beavers eat wood. Ah. Yes. You know what I'm saying? There so you that, go. that might be it. As I was researching this part, I read a story about a family that had a pet beaver, and you know what they named it? Sharon Stone. That's a great name for a beaver. That's, That's very you, good. You, please, yes, you know that. Right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> no, they don't. Uh, yeah. That would be terrible. I'm trying to think of the name of the movie, though. 
I'm not uh, going to help you. Yeah, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know the name of the movie. Ent- not Entrapment? No. I I'll think give I you guys, got it. I'll give you guys a little what. Is it Basic Ink? Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yep. Thank God. Yeah. Almost redeem yourself. Fuck you, Stone Temple Pilot. <laughs> yeah. I also <laughs> saw a not-so-popular nickname for the vagina. It came across every nickname for a vagina. I got one of those lists, and there are some rude ones. But one of them, and please, maybe, Vibs, do you mind Googling something? Map of Tasmania is what they call uh, the vagina. So if you just if you just go Map of Tasmania... It's just sort of a upside down triangle in the middle of nowhere. It kind of looks like you could have hips here. There's a, a song about here. it. Correct. I'm, I'm, yeah, it, it looks like a kind of like a bikini line almost. Yes. So I uh, some people I think it's, oh, I think yeah. that's highbrow. Really? I think it's highbrow that if you went up to a young lady and you're oh. like, how about I throw a couple of gimlets down your throat and you show me the map of Tasmania. Like, I think that's next level. Let me put my nose on Melbourne. I was on looking that. at the map of Tanzania. <laughs> and you have that, uh, <laughs> that album cover. What is that album cover? Pill. Public Image Limited. Yeah. Go. Yeah, Pill. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Talk about <laughs> big difference. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Yes, exactly. That's Tasmania. Talk about going down under. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I told you. The beaver yeah. one. It's all about the puns. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they love it. I was the people headache. love it. Lazy yeah. writing my ass. Oh, Sorry. forget about it. No. <laughs> Uh, before we move See, on from this beavers. makes you want hairless, right? Yeah. Like yeah. That, uh. yeah, it also looks like a messy beard. Like it'd be hanging well, off the chin. I mean, they call it a beard, yeah. too. Yeah, no, so. 100%. Bearded clown. Your nose goes right yeah. in the belly button. Beard uh. Where's your beard? Uh, before we move on, I want to talk about castorium. I'd ask Danny to look this up. That's that beaver extract from the castor yeah. sacs located within the assholes oh. of mature beavers. Did you know about this before I wrote it down? Yeah, we did a beaver anal gland whiskey on lowering the bar. That's the last thing I was going to mention. Is it the one that I, I threw a picture in there? Is it Ode de Musk with the beaver on it? Yeah, Ode de Musk from like Tour de Lac or something like that. That's exactly I say it. Does it, it was, look like that? Yep. Yep. Wow, that's, that's what we one. tried. It was actually pretty pretty damn good. It's from Tamworth Dis, uh, Distillery. Now, it doesn't it doesn't taste it like Tennessee? butthole at all. New Hampshire based. It New Hampshire, that's it. No, New Hampshire, that was it. Yeah. Maybe it's I can't be. really remember. Yeah, yeah. How many how many anal gland whiskeys are there out there? <laughs> I would hope only one. But uh, they use it for like a vanilla extract, and it's exactly what they use it for. And yeah, yeah. That's all I know about beaver. No, anal no. It's it, that's it. So <laughs> oh, it, that so everything look, about it. That's all I know about beaver anal glands. We're gonna find out some more because <laughs> so it's actually did, it's it's not a gland. It's a, it's got some it. biological. Uh, difference from glands, but it's located underneath the tail in and around a beaver's asshole. And like I remember we had uh, English Bulldogs, we had to have one of them had their anal glands eased every now and again because mm-hmm. it had a really Ugh. awful like uh, old fishy oil so that would gross. come out. If it got on your couch, I, you just had to burn the that's couch. That's what I was going to bring up when you're talking about a beaver getting locked in a cage. Is that the same Perhaps, thing? The anal yeah. gland like... Psst, Plus I think just like in general, animals get musty. You yeah. know what I mean? As do vaginas. My, my butthole would get musty too if I wasn't wiping <laughs> yeah. it ever. But this isn't the anal glands that you would have from bulldog or something else. This castorium is a raw in raw form. It's thicker. It's like a waxy substance. And when it combines with like urine onto their fur, it also helps them like mark their territory. It, but so and it's both sexes have it. It, it kind of looks like a melted chocolate chips. Like, yes, coming out of the. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's- Ugh. Uh, it's located in two cavities under the skin between the pelvis and the base of the tail. So, that you know, there's nothing else there but pure asshole. Uh, because of its proximity to the anal glands, castorium is often a combination of castor gland secretions, anal gland, sec- anal gland secretions, and urine. And since most anal secretions stink due to what's going on in an animal's guts. Not mine. So does this. Yeah, but a beaver's <laughs> is a little stink. different, no. Yeah. A beaver has like a... Um, a diet that is a little bit more it's it's bark and it's leaves so their castorium is a little bit more fragrant and it has a musky vanilla scent the consistency of molasses though not you know not as thick like an earthy yeah an umami it's known uh it's useful in simulating raspberry strawberry and vanilla flavors has been used in perfumes because of its fda label as generally recognized as safe. So you're allowed to use this. This is a legitimate, you know, you could have this in your medicine, not your medicine cabinet, in your spice rack, right? Manufacturers don't even have to list castorium on the ingredient list and may instead refer to it as simply natural flavoring. It's all legal. Yeah. According to 2007, 2007, couldn't get anything more recent, a safety assessment published in the 
International Journal of Toxicology, consumption of castorium poses no health risk to humans. These are all positives. What about your the mental health, though? Yeah, exactly. You know? About a thousand pounds of castorium <laughs> is used in consumer products annually, and it is not vegan. You can't consider it vegan because it's coming from it's an animal product. Right. It's not kosher, and it's not halal. Okay. I don't know if that means anything to anyone, but I kind of find <laughs> you it interesting. Never know who that might matter to. Yeah. You. No one knows exactly <laughs> when castorium. <laughs> I had yeah. to add it. Yeah. It's, it's correct to do it. Yeah. Uh, no one knows when it started being used as a food additive. Like I had said, it was primarily used in perfumes and whatnot. But a 2007 safety review estimated that it has been used in the food industry for at least eight decades at that point. So eight decades means that we're going back 80 years from 2007. I'll do the math. That's 1927. Okay. Uh, the most popular use for it was vanilla extract, as Vibs has said. Its early use as perfume may have inspired experimentation with it as a flavoring agent. But in 2011, the Vegetarian Resource Group queried five companies that produce vanilla flavorings about whether they have castorium in their products. Again, because this isn't vegan. So vegetarians then said, shit, is this in vanilla extract? I can't possibly eat that. I'll blow my fucking face up, you know, which it won't. And most of them said that they did not. No, all five replied that they did right. not. So perhaps it's not there anymore. We've talked about tobacco. We've talked about the absolute garbage tobacco that goes inside of a cigarette. You know, pipe tobacco versus cigar tobacco versus cigarette tobacco, which is just fillers. And once it's lit, there's 800 different chemicals that go off and all the different fillers that go into it. And I've, I've listed them when we did a twisted history of tobacco. It winds up that uh, Philip Morris is known to have flavored some 400 billion cigarettes with castorium in 1991. I ripped about 400 fucking 400 billion. <laughs> so tiny amounts used to make cigarettes sweeter and better smelling like a vanilla E like touch to your Virginia Slim. Well, no, it'd be Marlboro Reds, right? I know where right? you're going with Virginia yeah. Slim. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so if you smoked Marlboro, head, yeah, vagina yeah, slimes. In my head. If you smoked Mar, so this is me telling you. If you smoked uh, Marlboro cigarettes in the early 1990s, Winston's right, like my wife did, you probably inhaled a tiny bit of beaver ass juice. So I said, I ripped right? the butt. Yeah, you ripped the butt. Respect. It's also been claimed to be the secret <laughs> ingredient in Starbucks' famous pumpkin spice latte. Not, and not, I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't confirm or deny that. Then there's beaver schnapps. It's called beaver schnapps, a Swedish schnapps yeah. that is supposed I, to taste like a beaver. I know ass. for a fact, still, Blue Coffee does not put beaver does not. Do yes. not. Her, Shout in out. their coffee pods. Yeah, yeah. And as uh, Vibs was quick to point out in lowering the bar, New Hampshire-based company Tamworth Distilling uses castorium in their bourbon called Eau de Musk. So that's it. That's, that's it, our local. It, it really just tasted like normal bourbon. I didn't really taste yeah, anything different. Right. It was Before fun. you shot it, did you say bottoms up? <laughs> no. Uh, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah, waiting for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There once was a young lady named Eva. <laughs> I like that. Um, all right, so that's Beavers. I don't know why we started with that. Oh, I didn't mention this is Twist History. It's a mixed bag. I have no fucking. I have no rhyme or reason to this one. Yeah, people were really invested in the Beavers. Yeah, yeah. Imagine <laughs> yeah, if you thought I was going an hour rip. on Beavers. I could probably do an hour on Beavers. There's Help. a yeah. There's a PBS documentary <laughs> on Beavers. It's like an hour and a half long. We should do it. We should. Their teeth are fucking ominous. Like when you show a beaver's teeth, like when the yellowing of them they're and yellow, whatnot. Yeah. They're yeah. Like, they're pretty kind, scary animals. Some kind of orange-ish almost. Yes. It's it's. Yeah, that commercial the, is awesome with the beaver. You ever see it where he like does something with the guy with the trucker, and then the trucker looks at him. He's like, "You almost caused me to have an accident." And then all of a sudden, like the dam breaks and the flood comes, and he just because the beaver knocked down the tree that the guy had to stop uh -huh. saves his life. He's like, "I got you." Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is yeah. uh, that a Super Bowl commercial? It might Thank have been. You. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is a, this is a mixed bag episode. Probably should have said that from the onset. I will say before I jump off of beavers. We have, I think it's next week, so we're, we're taping this, I think, another week in advance. So the Twisted History of Deep Throat's coming up. Uh, Deep Throat, the porn movie, uh, celebrated its 50th birthday at the end of last year. Uh, longest running porn. It's got all these different records that had broken. And obviously there's, you know, stuff that we can make with Nixon and Watergate yep. and Deep Throat. So it'll be a full episode on it. And the gentleman who bankrolled and made uh, Deep Throat uh, wrote, produced, and directed it. Uh, he's passed away. His son 
was doing a press tour about what his dad had made. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty fucking big deal. And so our friend Lisa had reached out to me and said that she'd spoke to this guy and thought it would be perfect for me. So I listened to Lisa's podcast on it. So I'm going to have him on uh, just to talk about it. It's actually a fascinating story about this porn. And then afterwards, we'll get into Linda Lovelace, uh, you know, fucking a dog. And we'll get into all the stuff that's happened uh, with porn in and around that thing. So it's going to be a twisted history of um, Deep Throat coming up in a week or two. Right? You so, went from so, vaginas to Deep Throat. Yeah, yeah, before I get off. Perfect segue. <laughs> you don't want to... Yeah, yeah. You said that on purpose. When I, um, <laughs> when I think of the most enjoyable stuff that we do on Twisted History, it's tough to nail down. But every now and again, I, I hear a story about a guy and I make a big deal out of it. Uh, the perfect example was the way that I was shitting on Sully with guys, pilots, who I just yeah. found to be studs. And I say that all the time. What a stud. What a stud. So I've had a couple of stud kind of stories uh, pent up, whether they were sent in or whether I just had them in my inbox. So I'm going to do that, right? If that's cool with you guys. Absolutely. The first, yeah. yeah, the first one I'm going to talk about is a guy named um, Alexander Prokhorenko. Prokhorenko, not easy. Sounds like a Russian dude, so yeah. he's automatically a badass. He's in the Spetsnaz. Like, so the Spetsnaz is that they're, they're like... They're, uh, what would you what would you call them? It, it, is that they're like special forces? Hit, okay, uh, I was, okay. I was gonna like, say like Hitler's the Rush, SS. The, no, no, no. The, that, so this is afterwards. So I, I guess it, it probably like their version existed. of that. But it's, yeah, it'd be like a CIA. I think maybe? it's like their Green Berets. Okay, people. Somebody in uh, military, uh, you know, some sort of you know expertise is this. Correct me, but I think every now and again you'll see like Russian uh, army training videos where they're really fucking killing these guys. Like almost like when you see people, um, Navy SEAL training, how they make them sit in the water with the, the, the logs on them. These Spetsnaz people, pole, yeah. they kick the shit out of them. I believe that's the Spetsnaz. And I believe like they're people who are sent in for like hostage situations and stuff like that. Special forces. I think I'm pretty safe saying All that. Right. Yeah. And that so this sense. guy it was a uh, part of Spetsnaz, which means that he's a badass. Like I'm telling you a story about somebody who I believe is a stud. He's a badass. He's more commonly known, Alexander Prokhorenko, as the Russian Rambo, which is a great nickname. Russian Rambo's a great nickname. Great alliteration. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah the Spetsnaz. Uh, so this is all happening in 2015. I probably should have started with that. That way you didn't think that I was talking about the SS or something like that. You yeah. Know, it's 2015. It's much later. I just meant like a secret army. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think I think my closest thing would probably be Green Berets. Yeah, and it makes yeah. sense now. It's just something like a like division of the like military. Yeah. Um, so uh, there was a Syrian civil war, and Russia had gotten involved in 2015 at the request of the Syrian government. They wanted military aid from Russia against rebel and jihadist groups. So Russia had stepped in. So Prokhorenko is in Palmyra, Syria. I, I hope I'm saying that right. I've seen it written down in news a long time. It might be Palmyra. I don't know. Uh, and he's scoping out targets for airstrikes during the Syrian civil war. So he's one of these guys, the Spetsnaz, that would go in and basically be like, 10 clicks north, that's where I want you to start just absolutely dropping everything that you have. The Moabs and all that kind of stuff. That's what he did. So while he's scoping out um, targets during the Syrian civil war, uh, he's discovered and surrounded by ISIS forces. Right away, you're on this guy's side. Yep. Right? Like, there's nothing that gets your... Irish up more than hearing that ISIS is on the other side of this. Um, his superior had radio to him and said, get out of there. And this is what he had said. I'm going to uh, do a quote here. Uh, I'm going to do it in a Russian accent. I am surrounded. Ah, that's not good. They're outside. I don't want them to take me and parade me. Conduct the airstrike. They will make a mockery of me. And this uniform. I want to die with dignity and take all these bastards with me. Please, my last wish Conduct the airstrike. They will kill me either way. This is the end, Commander. Thank you. Tell my family and my country I love them. Tell them I was brave and I fought until I could no longer fight. Please take care of my family. Please avenge my death. Goodbye, Commander. So I'm going to start talking about studs because the Russian Rambo is a 25-year-old man who was married and was expecting a child. And he essentially called an airstrike in on himself. That's that strength that I don't have. I just tend to shoot myself in the head. I uh, got to get so it over. Take with. Yeah, these yeah. bastards with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What a badass. Yeah. So I, I don't have the fortitude. I don't have the fortitude. So when they talk about studs, know that I'm talking about guys like the Russian Rambo. Okay. And if I'm going to talk about Russians, I have to talk about some other guy. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving Russians and I'm going over to a, 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 a an American. 
This show is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process. Take me, for example. I'm a different man uh, than I was before I was married, before I had kids. Uh, the stress that I had when I was in Wall Street is different than the stresses that I may have here at Barstool. And one of the best ways to deepen your understanding and your self-awareness uh, is through therapy. And my personal opinion is that the best form of therapy you can get is through BetterHelp. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, it's flexible, and it can be suited to fit your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. So you can discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash twisted today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash twisted to get 10% off your first month. Sometimes talking to somebody else is the best way to find out who you are. I just watched uh, The Pacific. I told you. Yep. It's no band of brothers, but it's good. It's good. If you if you enjoy World War II yes. shows, if you enjoy decent shows, it's good. I should have watched it first, and I know it came second because Band of Brothers set such a high bar that I don't think that the Pacific could ever be as good. I might. This is kind of a left turn. True Detective Season 2 was not good. Great, but it wasn't dog shit horrible oh, like everyone says. It just could never have lived up to, yeah. to the one. The first one was yeah. it, the first outrageous. one was amazing. It's, it's, yeah, that's number but one not, all time. But not, but like episode one, two, three, and four were not because he dumped it. He was like, "I'm not watching the oh. rest of this." And then I watched episode. I'm like, "Well, I'm going to see how it goes." Uh, I was locked. And episode then I was like, two. "Oh my god, you got to go back." <laughs> episode four is where they do that continuous shot through like the the ghetto or whatever when he's like got the oh, stolen guns. Through, yeah, yeah. No, I think yeah. that's five. Oh, that's because, five. Because that's... four was like he like he dropped off right at four. I think it was whatever one it was. And yeah. then the next one, I'm like, oh, I'll watch. And then I'm like, I I think I binged it. The rest I was up to like just four in the morning. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, you gotta go back and watch this. This was insane. Right. Just Alexandra Daddario. Leave it at that. Oh, the striptease scene. Oh my god. No. With Woody Harrelson. Wasn't it wasn't a striptease scene, was it? They were hooking up. Woody okay. Harrelson. She was the right. she was the side. There's chick. a naked scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, naked. Did I miss that or no? <laughs> yeah. What? 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 No, no, I think no, it was no. Episode, episode two. Oh, was it? Yeah. So I, I gave up even after that scene. That's wild. That's how much I disliked <laughs> it. Oh. And then I went back in both feet and I enjoyed it very much. No, you didn't see that one because I told you you would love that scene. It, right. Is is <laughs> you've seen? Have you seen Godfather three? Ugh, uh, no. yeah. I've heard it. I mean, obviously, Godfather one mm -hmm. and two amazing, mm -hmm. but I've been told just not even watch three because it's bad. No, same thing. So I, I haven't never watched is, it. Is it? Is it? I've never seen it. A solid movie if it was standalone, no. or is it just dog shit? Yeah, it's not. A, it's not a very good movie. Okay. And and the actors, like, there's something about um, uh, the Godfather being set in the time period in which it had taken place that made it a little bit more not relatable by any stretch of imagination but a little bit more endearing this new flashier type thing where they're hanging out in the vatican and you know andy garcia who i love um it, it just didn't it didn't bring me in at all the acting was was awful in it too sofia coppola oh my god she's dog shit bad yeah uh, so it is what it is yeah. but i'm going to so the reason i bring this up is because there's a guy he's a medal of honor recipient which is a big deal his name is uh, thomas baker he fought in the battle of saipan in World War II on the island of Saipan in the Mariana Islands. Uh, and he was there from June 15th to July 9th, uh, 1944, as part of Operation Forager. So Forager included a number of battles, I think like Peleliu, which you had seen uh, in detail on HBO's Pacific. Mm -hmm. So, And actually, the Battle of Saipan in which Thomas Baker fought in was called the Pacific D-Day. So this was a big deal, right? So it's a 28-year-old guy from Troy, New York, shout out, who joined the U.S. Army after graduating from high school, and he found himself fought, uh, fighting in the South Pacific. That's enough kind of to make you a stud, I think, but it goes uh, further. On June 19, 1944, on Saipan, he advanced ahead of his unit with a fucking bazooka, and he destroyed a Japanese in, uh, emplacement which was firing on his company. That's, I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Bazooka is probably second only to a flamethrower is the coolest thing you can hold in your hand, right? Agreed. Yeah. Yep. Uh, several days later, he single-handedly attacked two groups of Japanese soldiers, uh, their ranks consisting of two officers and ten enlisted men, and he unhesitatingly attacked and killed them all. 
right? One against 12. I think a spear gun's kind of an underrated weapon. I was going to say weapon. a katana, I think, would be up there. For yeah, but you so can't. So a samurai sword? Yeah. You, so if, you're, if we're going to, I'll stop because this is my shit. Yeah. If you're uh, going to have go. something in your hand, not for a zombie apocalypse, not for anything, for the cover of your action movie, I think a fucking bazooka is a good start. I think a flamethrower is a good start. I don't know if a spear gun has that grabby toss. In. Not, not for a poster of a movie, but uh, a katana for yeah. for a poster. Kill sick. Bill. It's kind of yeah. the same thing. Yeah. I, I just think then that my poster would beat the shit out of your poster because I have a fucking bazooka. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like or like a machine gun, like a belt fed, whatever they are. My M50s. poster probably makes more money than your poster, though. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I hear you. Bro. Um, but, but who's the, holding it in the picture? What's That's that? going to make the most money. Yeah. Well, I am. Oh, man. oh <laughs> yeah, you got you got a, a bazooka, but I got a little sweet honey next to my right. thighs, <laughs> looking like she's about to s- suck, suck me off. off. Right? <laughs> yeah, big old map of Tasmania oh, falling sorry. out of her fucking <laughs> bikini bottom. So on July seventh, nineteen forty four, his position came under attack by a large Japanese force. Okay, and although he was seriously wounded early in the attack, he refused to be evacuated and continued to fight in the close range battle until running out of ammunition. When a con- so a comrade, sort of like a Forrest Gump type moment, uh, 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 one of his fellow soldiers was carrying him out of the suck when that soldier carrying him had gotten shot himself. Okay, and another soldier then comes to try to carry him to safety, and he says, and this is the quote. Get the hell away from me. I've caused enough problems. Give me your 45. Because he doesn't have any more guns on him. And at his request, this other soldier left him propped up against a tree and gave him a Colt, a Colt 1911 single action recoil operated semi automatic pistol, which had eight bullets in it. Eight, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight bullets left in it. So he's propped up on a tree. Everybody else is retreating. He's got a a gun with eight bullets. Nobody knows what happens to him. The next day, when American forces retook the position, they found the empty pistol and eight dead Japanese soldiers around Baker's dead body. That is that to me is that's awesome. That's better than a bazooka. Baker would be posthumously promoted to sergeant. And he also received the Medal of Honor for his bravery. So if you're going to remember people, we tend to remember a lot of people on this, or try to have people remember, uh, be remembered on this show. Names like Thomas Baker should be one of them. I think Alexander Prokhorenko, or at least know that he's the Russian Rambo. I wish that Thomas Baker had a nickname, because a couple of these guys who do have nicknames are absolutely uh, fantastic, including this next dude. He's a Russian guy named Stanislav Petrov, and his nickname is the man who saved the planet. Stanis is a great name. Yeah, Stanislav Petrov is, uh, he's not a household name, uh, but he should be, uh, because he single-handedly saved the world from nuclear Armageddon. If you think back in history, when were we closest to being wiped off the face of this earth? I'm I'm asking. uh, Yeah. Um... Oh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, probably. 100%. I, I think that if you ask intelligent people, or historians, or intelligent historians, and I'm pointing to Vibs, when were we the closest to being wiped off the earth? It would have been 1962 with the Cuban Missile Crisis. I spoke about the Cuban Missile Crisis barely when I spoke about somebody who lived 100 years. Remember we did that one? Where yeah. I had somebody who was born in like... You started, if you were born in like 1900, you would have lived yeah. through all this. Yeah. And their, I, their lives I were love just, that one. That was good. I love that one. I love a linear um, progression. But so for people who don't remember the Cuban Missile Crisis... Shame on you. So is this standoff that we had with Russia, and it was, it was, it was bad. It was bad for for many many days, for a couple of weeks, uh, for a couple of weeks. It was Khrushchev who was the premier at the time, and JFK who was president at the time, and nothing had happened. There were a couple of things, and I'll I'll do a twisted history of the Bay of uh, the Bay of Pigs mm-hmm. at some point, or the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we'll get into it. But I think most people think that that time in 1962 is the closest that we ever came to wiping each other off the fucking face of the earth. But I'm going to tell you, in 1983, 
so more than two decades after that, 21 years after that, this one guy, Stanislav Petrov, he's working in like a, a, a Russian m missile detection center. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminds me of like the Chernobyl. I keep going back to HBO specials, but like that Chernobyl feeling to it, mm -hmm. working in any kind of Russian government facility. That's what I'm envisioning in my head. So if you want to do the same, please. So Stanislav is there. All of a sudden, a fucking alarm goes off. The siren sounds, which is bad. So he looks on whatever detection thing he has, and it says that a nuclear warhead has been launched from the United States, and it's heading directly for Russia. And so there's a certain um, there's a certain thing that he has to do. There's a playbook that he has to do whenever that happens where he has to escalate it. It's not like he had his finger on the button and he would launch a, a nuclear attack back. But once that siren went off, another five went, no, another four went off, meaning that another four missiles were sent into the air and they were heading towards Russia. Nuclear warheads. Mm -hmm. And so if he was to escalate this on what he had seen, would there was a, a very good chance that Russia would have responded in kind. Listen, comrade. They got five nuclear warheads heading right for us. It's going to do devastating damage. There's nothing we can do to stop this. All we can do is counterattack. And then Russia would have sent the boat. They would have sent everything that they had, the whole nuclear payload. If that happens, game over. Somebody had a great quote once. The next war that we fight will be fought with nuclear weapons, but the war after that will be fought with bows and arrows. Yeah. Right? Because mm -hmm. that's the type of destruction that it's going to cause. Stanislav had the framework of mind to know that with his training, they said that in the event, you know, all this Cold War propaganda about this going to happen at some point, that it was almost guaranteed that if the United States was to launch a nuclear attack against Russia, they would send their whole battery of nuclear warheads. Dozens. So he was skeptical about there being only five. So instead of putting it right up the chain right away, he waited and he waited for like 23 minutes. And I guess there was still a point after 23 minutes or after a half hour where he could have still had hit the button and had these nuclear weapons be shot back and destroy the world. And in those 23 minutes, he found out that the satellite that does the nuclear missile detection had misread some sort of solar beams bouncing off the clouds. Yeah. It was 100% a mistake. And this guy had the wherewithal to not do it. So that's why they call this guy Stanislav Petrov, who in 1983, nobody knows about him. He's the man who saved the fucking planet, I, right? I think he was in a, a nuclear submarine, like off the coast, maybe, in the Atlantic. I don't know. All I had to do was reach for the phone to raise the direct line to our top commanders, but I couldn't move. Yeah. He had a dilemma. On one hand, it was just about conceivable that the Americans had gone suddenly belligerent and mounted an attack because just a few weeks earlier, the Soviets shot down Flight 007, the Korean Air Flight mm -hmm. 007, which had like a U.S. House of Representatives member on it. And they thought it was a U.S. spy plane. Yeah. So there was some pretty big tensions in the air, right? And it made no rational sense, especially when just a handful of missiles went up. And that's what stopped him from essentially leading up to pushing the button. I'm not saying that he had the, the glass case with the red button or he held the football, and mm -hmm. I don't know if he was on a sub. I wish I, I, wish I would have uh, looked into that because I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking it's more like one of those like Soviet outposts where it's like kind of snowing and there's one like you know telephone antenna coming up He's from it. Some yeah. high point in Siberia. Yeah. yeah. So he realized he was taking a huge gamble, and he went against uh, protocol. And as the minutes passed, he received no news of any missiles hitting uh, Russian targets. So he realized that he called the situation correctly. It later turned out the satellites had picked up sunlight, right? And read them as missiles. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, fuck. If another man had been in Petro's place, someone more by the book, someone more Russian. Like you'd think of Russian people, you'd right. think by yeah. the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the one guy from, uh, from Chernobyl who's just kind of following right. orders. Yep. You know what I mean? Then the news rods. certainly could have been reported to senior military <laughs> uh, officials and civilization would have been obliterated. Yeah. Like that's a definitive sentence to say. So so many what ifs, right? When this first happened, he was praised by his superiors and he was promised some sort of cash reward. 
But then he was also reprimanded for improper filing of paperwork because he had not described the incident in the war diary. That's very Russian. So he never got any kind of reward, at least not from the Russians. According to Petrov, this was because the incident embarrassed his superiors and the scientists who were responsible for it. He was reassigned to a less sensitive post, took early retirement, and suffered a nervous breakdown. He did last for a while. He died in 2017 at the age of 77. So he- extremely... Uh, similar to what had happened at Chernobyl. Like, they essentially had a nuclear power plant, plant melting down because of, you know, uh, just uh, just an error. Except this Russian error almost caused the uh, obliteration of civilization. Yeah, it, sucks, it sucks using common sense was viewed as a bad right. thing to the Russians. Yeah, like, yeah exactly. Oh, this yeah. guy saved everybody. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing a reward. that's kind of wild is, like, obviously we think Cuban Missile Crisis for the closest uh, to being wiped off the earth. But the doomsday clock is currently saying that right now doomsday we're 90 clock. seconds to midnight, which is the closest it's been to being wiped off earth uh, ever. I'm, since, really? I'm since 90 Albert seconds to midnight it. after all that beaver talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you're saying that because six- of what's going on in Ukraine. Yes. And the uh, fallout from us politically. Yeah. You know, and stuff like I that. mean, I kind of assume that if Russia is able to take Ukraine, then that kind of lends to China with Taiwan. And then it, just devolves from there, I right. guess. But I, I don't think we'll ever let China get Taiwan. I don't know. It'll it be, well, I, does, I, like, it doesn't matter what well, that, that's what the we thing or not, yeah. right? It, yeah, yeah, that's the war. Yeah, that's know? the war. That that yeah. would be the war, you know. And it's sobering to people who have eighteen-year-olds, sixteen-year-old sons, yeah. and stuff like that. But whatever. I, well, that's I, the so, thing. Like in social media, they, they the problem with it is that it tells you everything, and right. everyone thinks it's a current problem. But you go, you were, you brought up. The Bay of Pigs, right. that would have been successful if it wasn't for the New York Times, right? Yeah, like right. they're the reason that um, Castro knew we were coming and he protected his airstrip. I mean, right. I mean, they put it in the paper yeah. that we were doing it. So yeah. I mean, social media, if they're gonna, def- I mean, if they're gonna defend ta- Taiwan or if we're gonna do anything, we probably shouldn't post it. Right. I mean, it's pretty crazy with Ukraine too, just based on like the national perception. I feel like everyone kind of thinks they're pulling along and doing well, but it's like Russia's big. Yeah. yeah. Russia's a big power. Yeah. So that's Hitler. I yeah. I I enjoy posting what the military is doing and also giving the enemy a timeline of when we're gonna leave. Yeah. Just saying, hey, we'll, we'll be out by here. So just like hold tight. Well. Yeah. So doomsday clock. I mean, where where we are as far as DefCon. Remember that DefCon. They used to throw that around yeah. wherever. I don't even know what the highest one is to be honest with Def you. DefCon five. DefCon five. Is that so. the big one? I think. Yeah. Yeah. If you're gonna follow people, follow military guys. Yeah. Yeah. We need as to- a five, 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 you know, sprinkling a few in there just uh, to make we sure that we're doing the right thing. Currently at DefCon three right. as of the start of this year. Doesn't sound good. Nope. I feel like I should right. be a little more worried. Yeah. yeah. And they said same reasoning, Ukraine. Yeah. You, know, you know what? Mm. I love the fact that you're wearing a uh, Crocodile Hunter shirt, by the way. Thank yeah. You. The R.I.P. R.I.P. To, to Steve. He's yeah. the best. He died on my birthday. Yeah. Oh, that's Damn. so sad. He did. I, I, I thought he was, so sad? he was amazing. <laughs> he died at a... You don't like Crocodile Hunter? I don't know. You play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. That's what I'm saying. This How guy rolled around, he was, with fucking, he was rolled around with alligators Bahamut. for his whole fucking life, and he got stung by a stingray because he was in there with stingrays. I mean... I was, yeah. well, what's your, what's the point? I, I, don't, I don't know, like widows and orphans and stuff like that, just so he can make some fucking corny things about. He was teaching the kids was, about yeah, nature, I don't, I don't and as a result, his kids are growing up without a father. I, I have a I, that's, the that's same could be saying. said about all the food you eat. Oh yeah, okay, but it's what the food I eat versus wrestling with crocodiles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like let's go DefCon, uh, right? Like I my disagree. lifestyle is DefCon three. This asshole, not this asshole. He seems like a nice guy. His family is wonderful. He was he lived his life at DefCon five. I, I just, uh, it's tough for me to, I don't to gave, lament him. He gave like me a, a whimsical wonderment of nature and yeah, animals. Yeah, I thought yeah. he was fabulous. And God's kingdom. See, I think guys like yeah. him should are the reason we shouldn't have zoos anymore. Yeah. I know yeah, he's big Australia sad. zoo. I know he's a big, you know, I'm talking about like the way they have sea elephants and all these gigantic animals. Listen, I, 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 I hate paid zoos. money to see Bindi. Took the kids to see Bindi, right? I know, that was she's, awesome. We sat with Wiggles. them. Wiggles? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Nick I mean, was a big huge fan, Wiggles fan. But it's just, it's one of those things where I consider that I liked him. I thought he was he was great. My kids consumed everything, and he consumed everything. It's just a waste of a life. You know, it's a, I mean, in my in my opinion, I know he's brought us much wow, joy. Wow, that's like a, that's a like flaming a 12 take. alarm fire. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's absurd. Jeff Cobb. No, I, I, I do like, I, I think, 
you know, like when, and maybe because I think about my own mortality a little bit more, and Annie bringing up my diet really uh, no, cuts to the fucking quick. No, just saying, like, you but, know, like, right? it, you know, when you know you're not supposed to do when stuff, she's people do me stuff. fucking clean forks every day. <laughs> maybe she's part of the problem. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying that, I, like, you know, I, I, I don't know, like, these guys that I'm talking about. He was an educator. Like, I'm talking about somebody who, like, leaned against a tree with eight bullets and killed eight people. To, I didn't say he was you know, a hero. No, no. Yeah. I, I, guess, I, I guess that's why. I don't know if yeah. he gets, I don't know if he gets mentioned in the same breath as the guy who just don't, you know, saved the world. Correct. I, I think he does. Look up at Vibsy. Do I, mean, I we're, think we're it's talking vastly about more impressive. Said, oh, no, you know I, what? this guy didn't exist, right? <laughs> does that make a dent? Consider compared to. Uh, the guy who didn't press the button and, and wipe out all of civilization. You you can't compare the two. Pressing I the didn't. button's a step above. But I think the, the shooting eight him. guys, I think Crocodile Hunter might be on par with that. No, that's, no, that's no. Crazy I, really no. I really think I mentioned now, what him. About, now, what about the 13 he killed no, single-handedly no, no. and the others he killed with a fucking bazooka? What about the airstrike that killed a bunch of ISIS people that could no, have no. another plane? No, no, hold on. Then? I All mentioned he did was him because let me Vib- know what's the difference between no. an alligator and a crocodile. Vibsy was saying, uh, we, "I like the guy." I'm just saying. He it's said a waste. we're at DefCon three. Vibsy said, "Oh, I got to get a little become a little bit more of an alarmist." Right. So I said, "You know what? He's got his crocodile shirt on. I'm enjoy- I'm kind of enjoying the fact that Vibsy is living one day at a time, and he's letting the leaving the war and the protection of our borders to the." professionals and i thought that was nice okay <laughs> i kind of have it you, I got, you, I got, you got you went dark i got a sully like, feel yes, i got a sully him. feel about the crocodile hunter yeah um that's wild uh no you like him i'm not, I'm not saying anything a, crocodile uh, hunter would have a much better movie Temple pilots crocodile hunter do, would have do, a do, much you, better movie than sully can we can Fact. we set i stone Temple pilots thought of Thought they were Pearl yeah. Jam. It's just Pearl Jam. I'm, that's, yeah, that's I'm okay. actually good. so glad that I didn't know who they were right. because they sound like every other band that sings that type of music. They're trying to Was let like you know who? that they were Pearl not Pearl Jam, impressed. Soundgarden. Uh, I weirdly even heard some Hootie and the Blowfish vocals in there. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they weren't impressed. I'm sorry. Vaseline no, it, was the best one. What is it? Is it Plush? Plush is Yeah, Plush that, is good. They're not ones of... They're, they're not a hill you would want to die on anyway. If you... I think they're a very good band. They're and I good. think they yes, have I said they have music. five five songs that are instantly recognizable by anybody. Would you no. take them to an island with you? I was 100% wrong. I'd, because would they be on your playlist? These guys don't don't know them. So it's not by anybody. I'd, they have 10 songs that's recognizable by me. Yeah. Um, but I realized that I'm deeper into that. I'm older with you guys. I was a DJ at the time back then. So whatever. I I, I get that. But would uh, they make your playlist if you were on an island? No. Would yeah, definitely one hundred percent. Really? No shot. No way. I, no well, so I, would, I would say not. I would say that Vaseline is no. probably one of my, and I don't sing karaoke. That would be top five. Hold me. on a second. So you're telling me if we all had to pick twenty songs to go on an album, and you that's all you listen to for the rest of your life, you're picking a Stone it. Temple Pilot song. I, I no absolutely way. I challenge that. That's absurd. No way. Yeah. Your, your so library of songs. Me, I would pick you're any you Soundgarden. You're going to judge Pearl my Jam 20. You would take any Soundgarden or any Pearl Jam song over that. Maybe not over it, but it's on par. Uh, you would a never stone put percent. a Stone Temple Pilot song. I think or, that they're I on par. I would say on par because I think those bands are no do way. it so much better. Yeah, I agree with them. Yeah, so I would say that <laughs> Soundgarden is a totally different band. You'd pick a Soundgarden than, song before you pick one. Hold on. I would say that Soundgarden is a totally different band than Stone Temple Pilots. I would think that the grunge movement, people sort of lump in Pearl Jam, sometimes Nirvana, but people tend to pay attention a little bit more to Nirvana because of the story. People tend to lump in the whole grunge movement as sounding like Pearl Jam. I would think that if you were to play any Pearl Jam deep cut versus any Stone Temple Pilot deep cut, I would be able to tell without, you know, be like, oh, my God, that's that they have a distinct sound. And I don't want to bring Clemmer in here to help me out. Oh, <laughs> but, God, no, but, yeah, no. Clemmer he's a, he's, is he's, Clemmer he's, is got a, pl- a playlist that is right for oh, my and I and I realize I'm picking guys in the bunker. I happen to love Clemmer. And if we ever do a baseball thing, we have to. Have yeah, him absolutely. No, we should have had yeah. fucking encyclopedia. Yeah. So here's the hill that I'm going to die on. I'm going to die on two hills. Crocodile Hunter, great guy, <laughs> extremely disappointing. I feel for his family. As a father, I think that it's a waste to no longer have a father because he was fucking around with useless stingrays. That's all that I'm saying, okay? Secondly, Stone Temple Pilots, 
for that sound in the 90s was a top five band. I don't want to say that they're better in Pearl Jam because I don't believe that they were. I don't want to say that they were better in Soundgarden because it's going to piss people off, particularly because Chris Cornell is dead and whatnot. But I put them up there in that Pearl Jam-esque. And then you have like Screaming Trees below there and, and a bunch of people that you guys never heard of. All, uh, I would say that Stone Temple Pilots by far we, is a better band than Nirvana. I was about to oh, say, yeah, I, I, can fully, I can fully agree with yeah, that. I had yeah. a better time listening to it than a Nirvana song. Right. I, I saw Nirvana, and I told people, at the Blind Pig in like Michigan and whatever in 1990, awful fucking concert. And I'm a, I'm a simp. For Dave Grohl now, I think the Foo Fighters. I think he's the best front man who's rule. alive yeah. today. Rule. Best full uh, front man who's alive today. I mean, you can name somebody else. Brendan Yuri, uh, Panic at the Disco. I think his voice is unreal. Uh, right. What's his face for Red Hot Chili Peppers? That's a wild take. Red That's Hot a Chili wild Peppers. Take? Panic at the Disco's front man being better than Dave Grohl. Yeah, I, I, I think I think Brendan Yuri has maybe one Dave of the Grohl best voices top. vocally. In rock. No, no, right. vocally, vocally, he's, no I'm he's saying great. Like, I'm not saying he's the best singer in the world, Dave Grohl, because there's no way he is. But I, I th- and I know Paddock saying. at the Disco. I think he, he the guy's a Key. downright yes, he's, operatic he's a great voice. Seen it live that, too. Yeah, and I'm, incredible. But I think that yeah, Kiedis is a great one. I think we've had this conversation before about who the best front man not is. Not these guys. Yeah, you and I do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Not here. We I put I put Grohl up there. Scott Whelan, a uh, Wyland. I can't put up there because he's dead. Um, but tell me now, would Stone Temple Pilots make a t- uh, if you had to go on it forever just listening to a a playlist? 20 songs, Stone Temple Pilots make it. I, uh, Annie, you know I have thousands upon thousands. <laughs> it's easy, but yes I, or no. Nirvana would make it. Soundgarden would make it. Would I'm make saying, it. I, I, like, mine would be filled with would all Stone girls Temple... with great fucking voices. I like you 20, have that. Is I Stone... like 20 uh, songs better than Stone Temple Pilots, yes. Okay. But that's a fucking preposterous question no, it's because not. I like a million oh, songs. On. You got to pick 20. Honestly, Baby. You got yeah, one yeah. CD. Yeah, would you... Would, would, Give me your favorite band, John Mayer. So his fucking list would be 10 John Mayer songs. No. That doesn't leave a lot of fucking room for people that he actually loves. I couldn't possibly pick 20. Be like telling me to pick my favorite meal. I listen to music. 50 and I songs? Eat. Would, if you yes. had 50, you 100% think, really? song, I would fit. I would, I I would, fit, I challenge I would that. fit Stone Temple Pilots in my top 50. I challenge that. Okay. I, say, I do. It doesn't I, matter. Because it's my fucking thing. I think we should, Honestly, have, I think you should challenge do this. it all you want. I think yeah. we should do this. Do yeah. like 18, 20 songs. A blank yeah. CD's worth. What? Yep. How about... How oh, about he's t- got them. I can tell you right now, Stone Temple Pilots is out of the... I could pick our the top five playlists on our album, on our, on our song library. I right. bet there isn't a Stone Temple Pilots song in them. Let's do it. Let's do yeah, 12 songs each. I haven't listened. But that doesn't mean anything. Why that you doesn't sat mean down anything. Like, time to make like I, I think Billy Holiday, I think uh, has one of the greatest voices that ever lived. It's definitely not on my fucking, uh, you know, top ten list. Top I disagree. 50, top 100 Our list. wedding album is Benny one of them. King is 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 not on the, and I think it's one of the most beautiful voices that ever lived. I couldn't live without hearing him one more time. But he's on one of our playlists. Yeah. I I just I just wanted to say if you <laughs> if it was <laughs> if we were doing trivia and they played plush. I would have said that's Pearl Jam. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I, I agree. With I've that. heard. I would have. I've heard. You're it. ignorant. I hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, it's my. It's in my like my like history right. blind my spot. My island's gonna have way better vibes. Let me just say that if you're right. bringing Stone What'd Temple, my, I said my island's gonna have way better vibes. <laughs> Ours, mine's gonna be bound. Coconut bar. <laughs> also, but yeah, Nirvana <laughs> overrated. Jimmy what's, Buffett. What's his face? Is, I was is, never a Nirvana. Just a but drug I love addict. Dave Grohl. Always have. Yeah, Dave Grohl's great. I wasn't a Kurt Cobain. Good front man. Good charisma. Good showman. Oh look, he's all sad. So, uh, but is it still Mayor number one for you? Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I love John Mayer. Red Hot Chili Peppers. If I had to pick a band, if you were like, give me a band, I'd pick Red Hot Chili Peppers. Is Stone Temple Pilots better than Red Hot Chili Peppers? No, 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 no not a chance. Aww. I'd put them on a level of. I like, feel like I should just agree Dave with you because Matthews I feel bad band. for you now. <laughs> See, Dave Matthews band. Yeah, well, I don't. Dave Matthews. I, I don't mind massive. early Dave Matthews, and I know people here are big stands of his. Yeah. Like, uh, he's okay. I, Let yeah, me ask you this. Like original, Who do you like, like better, Jimmy Counting King? Crows or Stone Temple Pilots? Counting Crows, 100%. <sighs> probably probably uh, Counting Crows, one album. One album. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, like that. That's fair. Red Hot Chili Peppers and Stone Temple Pilots I have a tough time comparing because, you know, and I, I'm the one who asked the question, but I'm saying it out loud, because Red Hot Chili Peppers have been making hits in, I think, four decades. Right, like all right, smashing like pumpkins, Stone Temple first, Pilots. Yeah, Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I might take them there too. Yeah, like see, I could name you some Smashing Pumpkins, like could you? Rat in a cage. Really. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But like 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 Stone Temple Pilots? No. I, I, I think uh, the, I, I think the longer lasting ones, and again, you know, people die. <laughs> you know, Blind Melon. How good were Blind Melon? Who knows? Shannon Hoon fucking died. Right. You know, like that whole thing. So grunge. Yeah, grunge is just such yeah. a small period of time. I think boy bands came in and just kind of took it over right. and got rid of it. Like I'm not a huge U2 fan, but early U2 mm. was fucking elite. Like, yeah. I thought it was great, like, when they were kind of raw and 11 o'clock TikTok, all that shit. And then as it gets to new and they put it down your throat on iTunes, yeah. I you can't right. stand it. Which camera should I look at? I hate you. You hate you too. Yeah, I do, too. All they of you, too? Or just... No, see, all I, of you, too. Or, like, Sunday Bloody Sunday, like... Yeah, that's a good, song. good enough so song. They're early, this is 80s, right? Yeah, the early yeah. stuff, like, we didn't get introduced to the early stuff. We just had their... their the shit they try to put on our iPads. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, like, I get mad when they say... When they refer to Van Halen with... Sammy Hagar. Like, I'm like, oh, Van Halen, know. not Van Hagar. Like, where can I put Stone Temple <laughs> Pilots where you're like, oh, you're not going to throw a Zeppelin song in there? Zeppelin might be the best band that ever lived. I right. loved Van Halen growing up. Mm-hmm. I can't possibly, I couldn't possibly put 20 on a fucking island. I'd be like, well, you had, you had mentioned, you had alluded to it. So, I, you know, because you, yeah. you throw give that me, at me, me every nails, car ride. <laughs> hate machine. I do, right? I do want to do that, though. Yeah, we'll yeah, do uh, next week. We'll, next we'll, week we'll do uh, just send them to me. We'll do social posts for it. Okay. Right. And I will tell you, too, before next week or within the next two weeks. No, Jack, I think uh, Deep Throat will follow this. Yep. So this try is, to watch uh, Deep Throat. Artist tonight. Yeah. Will right. everyone watch? Yeah, we'll watch it. I've never seen it. The, yeah, no. I'm never have you seen it? it? No. The movie? Yeah. We're going to watch it. We're going to get popcorn. and. I'm going to watch it on the plane. I'm going to take notes. We're going to yeah. watch it on the plane. No, but I, you I've can't never watch seen it on it, the plane. And I'm assuming that it's going to be awful, right? Like, I think we're going to yeah. be universal on that type thing. I think there's going to be a lot of hair diapers, like hair a lot diapers. of hip-to-hips and stuff. But um, By the way, did he ever tell you what he did to me when we were working on the training floor when he changed my password to Merkin? And I had no idea <laughs> what a Merkin was. <laughs> And you had to ask somebody? Yeah. Or you, yeah. Well, I didn't know what my password was. So my friend John's like, oh, it's Merkin. I'm like, oh, what's Merkin? They're all like, oh. <laughs> bunch of right. idiots. Sorry. All right, let's get back to this absolutely inane fucking conversation right. that we're so, at. I can ask deep, uh, deep Throat, the, there's a movie and a porno, right? No, the porno. The porno, okay. Yeah, all I don't right. think there's a movie. Oh, The movie okay. is the porno. Got you. Yeah, yeah. And then Deep Throat was just the accomplice in the thing. They named him Deep all Throat. All the president's men. Yeah, they yeah. named him Deep Throat, yes. Got you. Okay. All right. After the I'm movie. Here. You have to yeah. watch the porn. Okay. You gotcha. Watch porn. I just... So watch the porn. That's what's celebrating its 50th anniversary. I think you'll see whatever, right? 1972? And we've spoken about her. So so I'll send you the, I'll send you the script from that episode so you Linda know her Lovelace, background. Linda Lovelace, but she might have been Linda Borman back then. It's hard to deep... Uh, it's hard to... It's hard to deep... Uh, it's hard to <laughs> type in deep throat porno and, and yeah, have and it come up. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. He's still going to watch it on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little She's three, a little three cheese. You'll be, be good. Sitting, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little three cheese. You know what? You're going to end up loving it. Yeah, yeah. Me sitting... I'll be sitting between Devlin and Frank the Tank. Watch it deep throat. The worst is going to be when someone picks up your phone and being like, "What was? Can I use Daddy's phone?" Sure. <laughs> Where the fuck were we, by the way? It started with me. Bay saying of Pigs. Crockett, we were talking Crockett. about Cuban Missile Crisis. Rest in peace. Definitely. And I feel so bad. And by the way, his wife was a sweetheart too. Yeah. Crocodile Hunter's wife. The whole who did family like, all the zoo pretty, We pretty knew great, it. Yeah. So, like personally, because Mick was obsessed. And the son is a him. dead ringer. Yeah. 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 Bendy's yeah. hot. What it's happens? If, what happens <laughs> if they get bit by a fucking snake and die? Like, what more does that woman have to go through? I don't... Just get a fucking desk job, honestly. Learn a lesson. Well, we, their zoo's getting closed <laughs> down, or they're, they're closing it down. Oh, that sucks. Zoos should not book. exist. We right. have some, <laughs> like, 3D printers. Oh, we Jesus. can't, you know... All right, here we go. There's a letter from a guy named Cole. Cole Reardon. Hey, Large and Twisted crew. Love the pod, especially the nod to aviation. As a pilot myself, coming from an aviation family, I just wanted to push you in the direction of a gentleman named James Goodson. So here's another name. Don't remember Scott Whelan. Remember James Goodson. Uh, he was wrongfully attacked on a civilian boat by a German submarine, which catalyzed his anger towards the regime. After rescuing himself and others on the attacked sunken boat, he decided to enlist as a pilot, and he later went on to become a distinguished ace. And I looked it up, and he was. That boat was the SS Athenia. The Athenia was sunk uh, on September 3rd, 1939 from a torpedo from a German submarine U-30. It sank her in the Western Approaches. Uh, the Athenia is weird because it's the second boat that was named Athenia, and it was the second boat named Athenia that was sunk by a German submarine. No more boats named Athenia. No more boats named Athenia. So this guy was on the boat, and that spurned him to become a uh, an ace, an ace in World War II. 
Uh, the Athena was the first UK ship to be sunk by Germany during World War II. 117 passengers and crew were killed, and it wound up being condemned as a war crime. So this guy was on a turning point before uh, World War II. So this guy, so we're talking about studs, and we're talking about this guy, James Goodson. So he's a fighter pilot, and he loved to smoke cigars. He used to smoke cigars in the cockpit, sort of like that John Belushi character in 1941, which I think you saw, which yep. was a terrible movie. Horrible. Yeah. Steven Spielberg's 1941. Oh, yeah. So this guy would smoke cigars in the cockpit, and he would say that every now and again, if he dropped his lighter at his feet, there's no way you could bend over. So he would do a barrel roll awesome. so that the lighter would then be on the canopy, and he'd grab it, right the ship, and then relight his cigar. That's that's awesome, right? The plane and then relight a cigar. So I, I kind of think that that's a cool enough story. But then he wound up um, getting caught by the Germans, shot down and caught, okay? And this is where the legend uh, becomes. This is from the Washington Post. They wrote an obituary for him. He recalled that when he was captured by the Germans, he was going to be put to death. And one of the Nazis, who is also, I believe, a fighter pilot who had some respect for him, said, before we put you to death, we would like to offer you a drink, your last drink. And so Goodson says, instead of a drink, I see that box of Cubans or whatever over there. Would I be able to have my last smoke? And so the guys who are about to put him to death said, sure. Lights up the cigar. They light up cigars. He starts blowing smoke rings, which I just recently learned how to do, and it winds up I'm very good at it. Yeah. And the Germans were like, can you teach us to do that? And so they oh. wound up not <laughs> fucking killing them. Wow. Gee. Oh. That's so cute. You make them snowball and you rye? Uh, uh, so they said, can you teach us to do that? <laughs> so they wind up not killing the fucking guy. I know, it's an idiot. Um, right? And they start talking about their mutual interest for fucking cigars. So instead of being shot, Goodson was sent to a prisoner of war camp. And his quote is saying, people say that smoking costs lives. It saved mine. And then he was held in POW camps in Poland and Germany until he was repatriated in April of 1945 that's a great story he was called and everyone has a good nickname he was called the king of the strafers strafing is when like you know you just low flying right yeah low flying planes that would sort of gun stuff that's on the ground he's credited with sitting uh shooting down 15 aircraft and destroying another 15 on the ground during world war ii so he's got 30 aircraft uh to his thing he won the silver star nine awards of the distinguished flying Flying Cross, the Purple Heart, and 21 awards of the Air Medal. He retired from the Air Force uh, with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. So I appreciate Cole sending him in. That's uh, James Goodson, um, who was a stud. He was the king of the strafers. I feel like that's how you'd get out of a firing squad. Yeah, smoking cigars talking. with them. Like, yeah. Hey, wait, where are you guys from? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, Berlin. Yeah, what what grape is this? You know What's what I mean? Like, do something like that. Yeah. What's your talent, Vibs? We know he could blow a smoke ring. Oh, I. Sheer brute strength, get out of that <laughs> Nazi concentration Flex camp. I would, I'd punch them all in the face, put my fist through their skulls. Mm. That's just how Vibs rolls. I will tell people, you don't have to send me. Many people, and I'm talking like 20 people, sent me the story of Lou Pye. Yeah, he was in that movie. Do you guys see The Smartest Guy in the Room, the Enron documentary? Yep. I never saw it. It's good. But allegedly there is an Asian fella in there who they allude to who has a very large affinity for strippers. Did you notice that character? It wasn't a main character. It's been a while since I've seen it. So it's no. based on Lou Pai. Okay. So Lou Pai was one of these guys that worked uh, in with Enron down in Houston. I used to trade Enron. For people who don't know, I traded Dynagy. I traded Enron. So before the shit hit the fence. I was going to say, they're doing great for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was great, great stock to trade. Um, yeah, house of cards, though. But... So when he was working for Enron, he had an affinity for strippers. He had a wife at home, but he used to use like the private jet to like jet around. He used to do like thousand dollar lunches on the company. He was part of the problem with Enron. He got one of the strippers pregnant. His wife found out about it, and she says, "I want a divorce." Mm. And he's like, "Well, that is a great coincidence because I want to marry this stripper who I got pregnant." So he decides to restart his life. He sells all his stock in Enron. He resigns from the company. He pays off his wife. And he buys a shitload of land in Colorado. At that point, he was the second largest landowner in Colorado. On his property was a mountain that they called Mount Pi. This guy, Flex. a month later, the shit hits the fan with Enron. Everybody goes to fucking jail. He paid his wife 
$5 million, let's say. I'm making that up. He wound up paying the SEC on the investigation, I think it was a civil investigation, $31 million. So he got out without any kind of insider trading because they said he wasn't trading like Ken Lay getting out of his stock knowing that the shit was hitting the fan. That's insider trading. Mm -hmm. He knew he was dealing in a house of cards, and he got out at the expense of investors. This guy's like, I didn't get out. I knocked up a fucking stripper. I'm being served divorce papers. I'm going to fucking Colorado to buy a mountain. So they didn't come after him, except for 31, 31 million. So he made it out with 200 plus million dollars. Lupai. So, so, like, stay woke moment. Did do you think maybe he s- did see this coming and 100%. was like, "How do I get out?" So Andy was saying, "Yeah." So Andy is saying, "Like, like oh, he's as, as guilty as anybody else." He just got away and with that it. might be true. Yeah, but he had the best alibi that you could ever yeah, have. Yeah, hundred percent. A knocked up stripper and an angry wife. Was the was the thirty one million? Kind of like a bribe to the SEC to like leave him alone. No, he had to pay. He had to. Pay. No, that's a civil. That was, that's, that's, a, that's civil that's insider trading charges. Yeah, that okay. was his like thing. that was it. Where he was like, that was his penalty. Is like, that the biggest of all? To Thirty? No, no. no I, think I don't it was, think so. It was one of the largest settlements in history for one, the SEC's I, enforcement. I, I, uh, dealing with an individual alleged insider trading. It was it's one not, of the biggest ones. So I mean, not a company. A, a yeah, they've person. seized more from it, but it was one of the biggest ever, so it was big. Yeah. But like he still had a couple hundred million dollars and a you know a hot stripper wife at and a mountain Colorado, yeah. which he wound up it's selling. Like I think he's in Florida now. He's bounced around. He's had other jobs and whatnot. So, But it became, I think somebody put it on like, today I learned... Mm-hmm. In Reddit, mm-hmm. I get a lot of those. I love them. Yeah. So please don't stop sending them to me. But when this guy came up, I'm telling you, dozens of people sent me this fucking guy. So it's well, cool. That's a so company. I, I'm not yeah. Paid cool. six hundred and fifteen million. The the biggest settlement was the tobacco settlement. Uh, One hundred percent. Two hundred six billion. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, they wrote a check. I know. Yeah, yeah. That's so. disgusting. He got up. Oh, at you the know, end what? I think the <laughs> but the I think the biggest. Individual one individual. then became Stevie Cohn. That's why I yeah. just said six hundred and fifteen million. And Stevie Cohn wrote a personal check, yeah. I believe, for that. But that was years later. Um, but the firm had it. The hedge fund paid it. He didn't personally. His family office. Stevie Cohn paid it. He owns, six, yeah. It says it was his office. His firm paid million. it. And now he owns the Mets. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is from Austin Oxford. I love twisted history, and your demeanor, the way to tell stories. Cool. Thanks, man. That's the end of it, yeah, I think. No. I came across this female soldier I think you'd find interesting. Most badass modern female soldier. I never covered her. I don't know why. It's almost as if it's the base story of the Mulan cartoon. Her name is Malunka Savage, which, by the way, is an awesome name. It's S-A-V-I-C, but it's pronounced Savage. She's of the Siberian Army, just a wild life. All right, so I'll take that from you, Austin. It's a World War One story. We talk about female... Um, uh, soldiers in World War II all the time, particularly how the Soviet Union loved to use female soldiers, mm. how effective they were, too. Like we spoke about it much time. We don't do so much with World War I because back then women were relegated to being in the uh, medical corps, like that type of stuff. So um, it was actually verboten. They weren't allowed to fight in World War I. But this woman, was uh, she was determined to fight, so she shaved off all uh, most of her hair. She strapped down her bombs and she enlisted under her brother's name. And it wasn't until like her 10th mission that her gender was finally revealed. She'd been wounded before, but up until this point, she would always avoided being hit in the chest. But she was hit in the chest with Bulgarian shrapnel, just as is my luck, the bullet went right into my chest. And the field doctor who was triaging her, or treating her in the field, opened up her thing, and you know what he found? Massive, oh, massive, huge boobs, huge the Siberian Z. fucking tits, all like big floppy. No, no. So then it was found <laughs> out that she was a woman. So then her commander was like, "Okay, yo, this uh, dude's a chick. The chick is up. You can have uh, a position. We're not going to kick you out, but you can have a position with this like medical corps." And she said uh, that she would never hold. No, she would never accept any position that did not allow her to carry a gun and fight the enemies of her people. So her commander said he'd think about it and that she should come back tomorrow for his decision. <laughs> and instead, she stayed at full attention and told him, I will wait. So she waited there in his office for a couple hours. And he was like, fuck it, you can fight. Yeah. It's like me with she Bon Jovi. On, she went on to become <laughs> the single most decorated female soldier in the world. Right? That's military history mm-hmm. of the world. 
She was a grizzled seven-year veteran of three war, wars fought against uh, fought on two continents. She received a total of 12 medals of bravery from Serbia and its allies. Like She was fighting for the French for a while. She won the French Legion of Honor medal twice. The British gave Savage the medal of the most distinguished order of St. Michael, and the Russians awarded her the Cross of St. George. Savage was also the only woman to receive France's Croix de Guerre with the gold palm during World War I. Cross of War. France offered Malunka Savage... It's a terrible first name. <laughs> we talking about Ursula. Imagine Malunka. Yeah, Ugh. I'm um, Malunk- yeah, yeah. Malunka. Yeah, Malunka. That's said, not that's, sexy that at all. Beaver the big titties name. Oh uh, yeah, Mal- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent point. Uh, uh, they offered her a military per- uh, pension for her service, but she chose to remain in Serbia, and it was a uh, it was a mistake. So this poor uh, bastard, this poor bitch. So she gets through World War One. She's highly decorated from multiple different countries. She stays in Serbia. Uh, she gets married to a banker. They have one kid. Then he abandoned his family, and she wound up adopting three other children. So she's a single mom with three, and she took a job as a cleaning lady with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This is somebody who was one of the biggest studs ever. Then World War II broke out, and she ran an infirmary for the National Liberation Army. When Germany occupied Serbia, they beat the shit out of her in front of her children for aiding members of the liberation movement. And then they threw her into a concentration camp in Serbia for 10 months. She suffered brutal conditions, was released after 10 months, and lived her final years in poverty and died from a stroke in 1973. She was the Serbian Mulan. And that's not totally true. In 1972, there was some sort of thing where you could, like, it was some sort of, like, metal, you know, veterans convention. Mm-hmm. And so this is 1972. So she lived in poverty after coming out of a fucking concentration camp in World War II. War hero World War I. Concentration camp World War II. 1972, she shows up at some veteran thing, fully dressed with her medals, and everybody there was like an Eagle Scout. Or they had one medal. And she had the Croix de Guerre. Like, she had all these things. So France is like, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm living in poverty. They were like, no, no, please. And they put her up in an apartment for the last year of her life. She had a comfortable last year of her life before she died of a stroke. Mm-hmm. So maybe remember that name, Malunka. Malunka Savage, yes. the Serbian Mulan. As sad as it is, all I'm going to think about is the beaver. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Do we have to wrap? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to do one more woman. One is a stud. The other is a fucking monster. The first is the Dancer of Auschwitz. That's her nickname, the Dancer of this Auschwitz. Yeah, her name is Francesca Mann. Upon her arrival in Auschwitz in 1943, she was a Jewish ballerina, Francesca Mann. She was told to strip off her clothes and change into a prisoner's outfit. They were boxcarred in, and I believe they were about to be sent into the gas uh, chamber, right? She stripped in a distracting way, people say. Like, she did a little bit of a strip tease. And one of the guards who was looking at her seductively, she kind of, you know, did hold this thing. She reached down, grabbed her shoe. She hit him in the head with it, stole his pistol, and shot him dead. An SS guard. That's kind of a cool way. Yeah. Right? Uh, she was able to wound another guard in the stomach before she was killed. Then another woman who was present there took her attack as an opportunity, convinced a few other women to rebel. They were all murdered. This isn't a happy ending. No. But here's what happened. They managed to scalp one Nazi and tear That's, the nose off that. another. So they That's killed not... two guards, scalped one, and tore the fucking nose off another. Take That's as the many dancer. as you can on the way out. Yeah, the dancer of Auschwitz. I put a, I put a picture in there. She's a looker. A little cutie. Yeah, yeah. So they just made a, they didn't just make it, but they actually made a ballet in her honor. Um, and it looks terrible. And then the last one I'm going to do, I haven't done a Monster of the Week in a while. And then a buddy that I used to work with, his name is Sean Slattery. Everyone calls him Slats. Do me a favor. favor. Yeah. So he uh, he told me about uh, this woman. Her name is Irma Grace. G R E S E, but it's pronounced Grace. Irma Grace, and she's better known. Well, she's our monster of the week, but she's better known as the Hyena von Auschwitz or the Hyena of Auschwitz. I think mm. monsters kind. Yeah. She's also called the Beautiful Beast. Hyena, Beautiful Beast is a cool nickname. Really hyena really of cool. Auschwitz is yeah, terrifying. That's a lot. I told. I did one about Ilsa Koch. K O C H, mm-hmm. Koch, Coke. I really don't care. I don't need to respect her. But her nickname was the Bitch of Buchenwald. Mm. Yeah. That's a big one, too. So this is the hyena of Auschwitz. And the Bitch of Buchenwald, she was married to a guy who ran Buchenwald, right? This one is different. She was 13 years old. Her mother committed suicide by drinking hydrochloric acid. When you're done talking about her, I wonder how they're going to think she would fare against Malunka. 
Right. Not mm-hmm. a way to go uh-huh. drinking hydrochloric yeah. acid, I feel like. But she found out that her husband <laughs> was cheating on her with a local pub owner's daughter. So the mother was so distraught that she drank uh, hydrochloric mm-hmm. acid. Uh, and uh, this girl, Irma Grease, was only 13 years old. Uh, as a girl, she was enamored with Hitler, as so many young Hitler youth were, right? I mean, it's pretty charismatic. Uh, at 19, she found herself employment at a, as a guard at Ravensbrück. It was a concentration camp for female prisoners. One year later, in 1943, she was transferred to Auschwitz, rapidly ascended to the rank of senior SS supervisor. It's pretty big. The second highest rank that could be bestowed upon a female in the SS, and with that authority came a shitload of torture. In her memoir, Five Chimneys, an Auschwitz survivor, Olga, Olga Langyel. By the way, you say that your memoir is called Five Chimneys. It doesn't do much for me, but then you see it's an Auschwitz survivor, and you think of like five fucking smokestacks. Yeah. I think Mary Poppins at first. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that right? sounds lovely. Yeah. 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 Oh, you think of Van Dyke, you know, like yeah. a fucking. There's going to be Step a in sweep time. involved. Yeah, <laughs> and then you're like, oh god. Uh, but she's the one who was a big character witness for this. Said that Grace uh, Grace had many affairs with other Nazis, including Joseph Mengele. Uh, when it came time to select women for the gas chamber, uh, Jack, you're going to think I'm kidding around. She would purposely pick beautiful female prisoners, particularly ones with large breasts. Wow. For the thing. Uh, and that's that's fucking chilling to say out loud. Yeah. She had a, a fondness for striking women on their breasts and for forcing Jewish girls to be her lookout as she raped other inmates. It was also reported that Grace would sick her dog on prisoners, whip them constantly, kick them with her hobnail jack boots oh. until they were covered in blood. And lastly, the Jewish virtual library wrote that Grace had lampshades made from the skin of three dead prisoners, which they also said about the bitch of Buchenwald. Mm. None of this was ever proven, by the way. I think the bitch of Buchenwald, her lampshades were tested and wound up being cowhide. So perhaps they said it was skin. It really wasn't. I'm sure there was some stuff done with skin. There was guys who were yeah. collecting tattoos and shit, right? That's one of yeah. the things that people that go to Auschwitz, like I feel like they always bring up is the lampshades. Like mm. seeing those in it's person awful. is just scarring. Ugh. So it's crazy. But all that came to an end. Thank God. In the spring of 1945, right? That's when the shit hit the fan. The British arrested Grace, and along with 45 other Nazis, she found herself the cr- accused of war crimes. So, this is how young she was, by the way. At 22 years of age, she's doing this shit. She was the youngest woman to die judicially under British law in the 20th century when she was executed by long drop. That's our favorite type of hanging. Yeah. So, for people who don't remember, we did Twisted History of Executions very early on. Mm -hmm. Way before your time, Jack. It's like Stone Temple Pilots of episodes, right? So, the long drop was probably too good for her. Because the long drop is one of those things where when it's done right, they open up the uh, trap door and you drop down. When it's done right, it snaps your neck instantaneously. Pops, yeah, the yeah. neck out. Yeah. When it's not done right, your neck is not only broken, but it rips your fucking head off. So you, you can't lie about your weight when you're getting the long drop. Mm-mm. And also the, the, um, the last thing I'll say, the placement of the knot of the noose in the long drop was also very, very important because as it would go down, you know, your head would be sufficiently jerked back as the rope tightened and that contributed uh, to the breaking of this German cunt's neck. That's it for this week. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. We'll see you next week. 